Hello everyone and happy Earth Day. We're so excited that you guys are all here tonight. And my name is Ashley. I'll be moderating the event this evening. I am a conservation director for the Northeast region here in Nebraska. Um, and I serve with part of the AmeriCorps Common Ground program. Our uh, group's main focus is community outreach and environmental advocacy to help protect Nebraska's natural legacy. Um, you can find us on all social media outlets, but Facebook is probably where we're most active and it also provides uh, super easy access to all of our events. You can find everything on the event page. We're gonna continue doing lots of webinar stuff throughout the beginning of the summer. And then hopefully you'll start seeing some more in-person um, workshops as well. And so tonight I am joined by Steve Rohde. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, he's a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, also a professor at UNO, whom I've not been able to take a class with yet, but hopefully eventually will. Um, he's going to chat tonight with us about green infrastructure and sustainable landscapes and a little bit about his work in particular with the city of Omaha. Um, and then throughout the event, we will have uh, the Q&A box and the chat box both available. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the boxes and we'll do a small Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And then during the um, Q&A session, I'll also send out a very simple three question poll. Um, it kind of measures our current outreach for Conservation Nebraska and allows us to learn where we are so we can report to our grant funding and continue to present these sorts of incredible events for our lovely state of Nebraska. So take it away, Steve. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ashley. I uh, appreciate the chance to talk about this topic. I've spent a good part of my uh, academic career working on sustainable landscapes, green infrastructure, as you'll see in a second, what that is. Uh, and as a licensed landscape architect, it's been a real luxury to be able to incorporate that aspect into my work in the Department of Biology and Environmental Studies uh, at, at UNO. Uh, I was also a faculty member at UNL for 20 years as an extension specialist. So uh, most of my focus, again, has been on, on, on landscapes. So I was asked to talk about sustainable landscapes and green infrastructure. There is a lot of, of overlap. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of brief uh, what, introduction and some definitions. And then I have a lot of case studies here in Omaha. Uh, that I would like to go through as part of kind of showing you what this stuff actually looks like. So, um, so in, in terms of defining sustainability, uh, there's a lot of definitions available. This one I have posted is from the UNO Sustainability Master Plan. Uh, but I think the key consideration is that we're, we're combining environmentally friendly, socially responsible, and financially feasible. Uh, and as, you, as you'll see on the next slide, the, the, the triple bottom line triumvir is really important to keep in mind for sustainability. And of course, that second point, that notion of benefiting not only present, but also future generations, it's literally saving some for the grandkids. So sustainability, I don't think in its concept is, is, is complex, but it certainly includes a lot of different uh, considerations. Um, here's a couple of diagrams that are often used to try to define sustainability or at least show what it is. And again, it's that really important uh, overlap between environmental, social, and economic issues. Uh, as you'll see tonight, I, I think green infrastructure as a part of applying sustainability uh, does a good job of, of being able to touch on, on all three. Um, and, and a lot of people then ask me, so how do you apply sustainability to landscape design? So these are, I think, some of the key considerations. Um, and a lot of these a person can do in their, own, in their own front yard, backyard. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but the idea of reducing rates of consumption of energy, water, resources, uh, chemicals for sure, uh, maximizing recycling of resources. Uh, this local ecological structure and function, I think, is critical. As a landscape architect, I was taught to, to try not to mess it up in the first place. So the idea of having nature available or trying to emulate nature is important. That biodiversity is critical. Um, and then I think any design we do should enhance human quality of life. And it's a kind of a hard thing to quantify at times, but certainly the, the notion of, of the Japanese forest bathing and the idea of how much nature can restore us is critical, I think, as part of, of design. And, and so I, the, the, the kind of the summary of that is that last bullet where I, landscapes designed by nature, I think, is what we need to aspire to do uh, and, and almost think like nature would as part of what we do. 
So this is a famous quote from Albert Einstein. Uh, it's a favorite, look deep into nature and then you'll understand everything better. So I think it's an important consideration. Again, if we can put ourselves in, in nature's shoes in terms of what would have happened on a particular site, uh, I think it really helps us understand what we're doing a lot better. And we end up with landscapes that, that do all of those things we want them to do as well as enhance, uh, enhance our lives. So if you, if you try to break that down, um, if you have landscapes designed by quote unquote nature, at least in our urban setting, these are the things that nature typically uh, focuses on. So plants are in communities. So we're putting plants together with one another that actually are, are used to that, that might even protect each other as a small, maybe understory tree under a large oak tree. Uh, nature is very diverse in, in plant materials. I think we often tend to see the classic 10 or 15 plants over and over again in our landscape. So diversity and striving for that is really important to get beyond that. Um, we love the fast growing trees because they add curb appeal and, and curb value to our homes quicker, but we don't have near enough oak trees and slower growing trees that last a lot longer in an urban setting for sure. Uh, plant layering is important. So we think of forests as multi-level, but even out in a tall grass prairie, you have small plants growing underneath the taller grasses. So if we can emulate that in design, I think that's important. Landscapes are never completed. They mature, uh, they die. If designed well, they should last a long time. Uh, but we tend to look for that Kodak moment of landscape and then assume that's always going to be that way. Uh, landscapes can be very subtle, uh, but I, if you get your nose right up close and your eyes and, and really see what you're looking at, there's a lot of beauty there. Uh, nature mulches everything. Um, and it, we, we tend to, I think in some ways we overuse mulch. We might talk about that a little bit tonight, but that's important. And then this last point I think is as critical as anything on the list where nature provides us ecosystem services. And we've talked a lot uh, about that in, in academia. We, you see it in newspapers at times, but I don't know that we've really pressed the, the value of it up until recently. So this, this headline here on this slide, the economic value of ecological services provided by insects. And then as a, as a sub quote, $57 billion in the United States that insects are providing us this service. Um, and a lot of that correlates to pollinating food crops. So we, we tend to wonder, you know, we, we don't, I guess we don't give it a second thought that the insects, the honeybees, the, 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 uh, the nature services that provide us for free, basically, if we lose those, how on earth are we gonna ever support or, or uh, reconcile that? So I've seen uh, uh, ecological ecosystem services worldwide uh, estimated at trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars, if, if you can imagine. So our ability to, again, to think sustainably and look at landscapes in that, in that context where they're providing services, I think is really critical as part of, part of understanding them better. So to, to try to apply those concepts then to stormwater management, which ties back into the green infrastructure. Um, a lot of people ask me, why should we manage stormwater in the first place? Um, the two key considerations, uh, can you see my, uh, Ashley, can you see my pointer okay? We can. Okay. So the, the quality quantity um, are, are the two key considerations and, and quality really drove things early on in many ways with the Clean Water Act, the Cuyahoga River catching fire in Ohio back in the late 60s. Uh, quantity though, and we see a lot more flooding nowadays. There, there's a lot of, especially here in Omaha with the Missouri um, and the Platte. So between those two things, stormwater definitely does uh, need to be managed. Uh, I mentioned some of the regulations that tie back now for, for decades. Uh, we have some local ordinances here in Omaha now that require new development to manage the first half inch of runoff on a site. Uh, and we'll talk about that as, as part of the case studies that we have for green infrastructure. Um, again, environmental, economic, social issues all play a role in, in the management. It ties back to that, that uh, three sides of sustainability that we looked at earlier. And then I, I think this comment at the bottom is really critical. We all live in a watershed and our actions affect the water in our watershed and downstream watersheds. And I worked on a project with the city at one point where we asked uh, Benson residents on a Facebook poll if they lived in a watershed or not. And half the respondents said they didn't. And yet we all do. We live somewhere in a watershed where we have direct impact. So even just the, I guess the the educational context and awareness of the fact that we have those impacts is really important for, for us to continue to try to uh, help people understand what, what even some, sometimes some simple actions uh, can either enhance or, or detract from. So uh, 
What is green infrastructure? Uh, it's an approach to water management that protects, uh, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. This is from American Rivers Organization. And I think the key piece of this is that notion of mimicking the water cycle. So again, it's, it's back to trying to emulate nature and understanding what nature would do to manage runoff. Uh, so if you look down through this list, uh, these, are, these are some of what we call the best management practices or green infrastructure practices. Uh, we'll see some of these in these case studies that I will, uh, will show tonight. But it's everything from rain gardens, a small garden in a front yard, rain barrels, our entire Omaha, the, the city forest in Omaha is a great way to manage runoff based on the canopy and slowing the water down before it gets to the storm drains. Uh, wetlands are a perfect natural uh, way to, to manage uh, pollutants and runoff. Talk a little bit about green roofs tonight. Um, even just the idea of native plants uh, and xeric gardens, the idea of getting roots deep down into the soil allows more of an infiltration of water, which also helps with uh, the runoff. So, um, and I, I think sometimes people say, well, what, where, where do we need to apply this special thing called green infrastructure? And it's really wherever there is runoff with sediment or pollution. And if you think it in that context, it might be an ag field, it might be a construction site. Um, we often tend to, I think, over fertilize our turf grass and the extra ends up in the streets in the storm drain. So um, I think, you know, if it, uh, Minnesota has often been touted as having led the charge on green infrastructure. And I think a lot of that is that people live near a lake up there in, in almost every case of, of somebody being in Minnesota. So I think they're more in tune to the to the quality of water up there. And I, I'm kind of being facetious, but the Missouri historically was, was referred to as the big muddy. And so for that, that's not as near as much of a incentive, I would suppose, to, to think that water quality is really important. So, um, so again, green infrastructure can be applied virtually, uh, virtually anywhere. Uh, and, and so I, I wanted to show a cross section of a rain garden to kind of get this discussion started about BMPs. And again, very simple. Uh, there's probably some on this uh, webinar tonight that have a rain garden in their backyard or front yard and, and don't even don't realize it because what we're talking about is a shallow depression uh, soil that can infiltrate water, uh, healthy deep rooted plants that help help the, that water to infiltrate. Um, most rain gardens aren't more than about a half a foot deep. Maybe, maybe a maximum of a foot. The water typically is gone in two days. Uh, uh, one day is probably better, but the, the less time the water sits there, the, the more plant variety and diversity that you're able to, uh, to put into a, an area like this. So, uh, so I guess what I'm saying is a rain garden, in, 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 as an example, doesn't have to look like a rain garden. It can literally be a lower depressed part of a landscape that has been planted well and the right plants are there and it, it just, it, it, it allows for a little bit wetter uh, conditions in terms of plants you might not have in the, in the landscape otherwise. So here's a, this is where I wanna go again, this local regional case study uh, projects. So I think it's one of the best ways to show how sustainability and, and, and landscape thinking ties into some of these, these creative solutions that have been tried as part of trying to manage uh, stormwater here in, in Omaha. Um, uh, Omaha has a combined sewer overflow problem, as does 700 and some cities across the country. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. If you haven't, there's great information on the CSO website that the city puts up. All of our sewer rates have gone up uh, big time in the last decade or so. Uh, and the whole premise is that, that Omaha, like other cities, has dumped a lot of raw sewage into the Missouri when runoff is too much and overwhelms the wastewater treatment plants that we have. So this green infrastructure is in, in, in Omaha is, is kind of two based or has, has two modes to it. One is to cleanse the water before it gets to the Missouri and the other is to hold on to it so that our capacity to treat the water to put back in Missouri uh, is, is lessened in terms of the pressure to, to do that. So uh, I think we're now uh, working towards 2037 as an endpoint for the program. And it's gonna cost, I think at this point, a couple of billion dollars worth of investment to do the work that's being done. So I'm not gonna get into any specifics tonight on that other than to, to realize that it's really important for sure. And a lot of green infrastructure has been tied into that particular uh, uh, effort. So the first project here is uh, on the UNL campus. This is the Hayden House Bioretention Garden. And I, I, I show this picture, this is the before picture, uh, basically cattails. And I, 
I remember thinking to myself as I saw this on campus, I think we can do better. This is the front door to campus, literally. This is when the Hayden House was actually the welcome center uh, on, on campus. So we looked at the watersheds. Um, we, we looked at the runoff from the roof. All of this water that sits in the cattail area here is basically up from this side of the building and then from the, the roof of the building here. Uh, and so what we came up with was this design. So this is back in about 2011, I think at this point. Uh, this was the initial garden. Um, it was about $70,000. Uh, we got grant funding from the city, from the state. It didn't cost UNO anything. Uh, they provided maintenance for the first three years, but it seemed like it was a really excellent uh, way to show what green infrastructure is and, and do a lot of good on campus. Um, this is a, a plan that shows the garden. It kind of shows the two places where the water is collected. Each of these is, it will collect about 2,500 gallons of water as it flows off the landscape. Uh, there's always a need for an overflow in these gardens. So ultimately, if, if the water gets through this garden, it ends up in the storm drain as it would have otherwise, uh, but you can imagine with a lot more cleansing and a lot more habitat value. Uh, this cross section kind of shows the different relationships of where people can be. There is an under drain in bioretention. A rain garden typically doesn't have this extra engineering underneath. You're just relying on the natural infiltration in the, uh, in the soil itself. Uh, and I was, I worked with Big Muddy Workshop on this project uh, to do the planting design. Uh, and we kind of went crazy on plants. I love plants. It was a good opportunity for us on campus to try new things. Uh, I used them a lot in the plant ID classes as time went along. Um, so it, 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 there were a lot of projects like this early on when, when the first green infrastructure kind of started evolving in Omaha, where it was really valuable to kind of have a trial and error on a lot of this information, just see what was going to work. Uh, and what wasn't going to work. So it was it was a luxury to be able to do these kind of projects. Uh, here's some pictures just to kind of show what things look like in the evolution. Um, there's there's plants um, like this the cardinal flower here. This is great blue lobelia that that are actually aren't out there anymore. So some of these plants just like they would do in nature have kind of come and gone. They're perennials. They might reseed. They just get too crowded out. This is Virginia mountain mint back here. Got some goldenrod, some gray sedge out here. So uh, again, part of sustainability in landscaping is to let nature kind of decide where it wants the plants to grow and who's happy with whom out there. Uh, and that, that means that some plants you may have to give up over time, even though they're, they're beautiful when they're there. So uh, it's an evolution in many ways, very, um, uh, uh, it, it's a major comparison and, and um, there's a lot of, of um, can't remember, I can't think of the word I'm thinking of. Um, but there's a high contrast between what we typically think of as the landscape uh, and then what, what nature might allow for in terms of a, of a change in landscape over time. Uh, there's a lot of monitoring equipment out in this garden. Uh, there's mo soil moisture sensors, soil temperature. We've got some cameras I'll show you here in just a second. So again, there was a, a major investment made to not only get these gardens implemented, but to actually understand how they work over time. Does the water go straight down in the soil? Does it go sideways? A lot of these gardens in Minnesota have been shown to work even in the wintertime, which is really illogical given the, the, uh, the, the freezing in the, in, in the soil. So the, the, the better we understand how these gardens work, again, the better we can design them and, uh, and maintain them. And these pictures kind of, this, this shows the, the pictures from the, one of the cameras out there. And I've always been intrigued by these and how such a short amount of time a landscape matures in a, in, a, in a spring setting. And as a landscape architect, you're always looking for this evolution of pictures to show what your design ideas look like as they evolve through the season. You always want something interesting going on, obviously. But this is, the, this is what, April 8th, uh, 2017. Not much going on, it's still fairly early. Uh, this is what, only just a week and a half, couple weeks later. Uh, and stuff, it's amazing how fast some stuff comes out in a, in a garden setting. And then this next picture is, is May 26th and, and a lot of stuff flowering that wasn't. We got uh, uh, some uh, spider wart, we got some spirea out there. So um, again, it's really interesting. And I, it, it prompts, the, prompts the thought that, I, that we all, I think, should pay a little more attention and again, see what we're looking at when we're out in nature and in landscapes like this, because every day there's something that's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, and then with, there's actually a camera on the wall in the garden. So you can kind of see where one of these cells is filling up here with the, the water. Uh, and, and again, these are all designed, this water should be gone in a day. 
Uh, I think at this point we're ours because there's been so much great plant growth in this garden. Um, but the idea that the water would be there for several days is not only detrimental to plants, but again, at some point you end up with concerns about mosquitoes and, and, um, and just not looking good. So it's a key consideration that this water really has to, these gardens have to work well and function well as, in, in addition to look good. Um, and then it wasn't long before we had the, the big, biggest praying mantis I've seen in a long time, right out in the garden after the goldenrod had bloomed. Uh, and I, if you think back to that picture of, of nothing but turf grass and cattails, uh, I doubt we would have had a praying mantis out there given the lack of biodiversity. So um, it's always uh, very encouraging and it's, it's, uh, it feels good to see nature bringing its own version into a garden that's been designed with as much thought as we can give that garden relevant to biodiversity and, uh, and habitat value. Uh, this next garden is at uh, Benson Gateway. So this is the east end of Benson, uh, right where the where maple runs into the, uh, the Northwest Radial Highway. And the city uh, took this street out. This is 58th Street right here. Uh, this intersection up here had to be improved uh, as part of, of traffic safety. So the street was closed and the Benson Neighborhood Association, uh, Business Association, Omaha Valley Design got involved. And the thought was maybe we could do a, a garden on this closed street, which, which again is like how, how good a garden do you think you could actually put into a, a previous street? So the thought was let's try it. Um, uh, Dave Lampy was a civil engineer that did a lot of the design on this. Uh, th this is some planting design that I helped with in terms of trying to bring in some plants again that would, would be successful out there. Uh, so the water comes off a watershed just south of Maple here, several acres up in the neighborhood, comes down into the garden here. This was actually the first fall. We have some masters blooming, uh, a little bit of goldenrod. Uh, so this was early on in the process. Uh, and then here's the, uh, here's the garden. I would say this was maybe three years ago, something like that. So it's really evolved well. Uh, it looks like we might have a tree of heaven in here too, which this doesn't necessarily belong there. Um, but the, the idea on this was to actually have a garden uh, as part of the East End of Benson. So it, it seems to have functioned well, it's worked well. Um, there were a lot of concerns early on about whether or not the pollutants coming off these streets would be a problem in these gardens. Uh, and it turns out a lot of these plants do well with those pollutants. Um, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, plants like blue grama, buffalo grass can actually break down hydrocarbons. Uh, the mulch can adsorb uh, phosphorus and hydrocarbons uh, as well, uh, which means it sticks to the mulch. So we haven't noticed there hasn't been any significant severe pollution in this garden, but it's really interesting how nature can actually help either break down, absorb, um, uh, take up a lot of, of pollutants that we can then manage. We might have to cut the plants down, we might have to replace mulch, uh, but it's the idea that nature, again, we're working with nature to, to help uh, take care of what is, is amazing amounts of stuff that comes off of streets from, uh, from automobile traffic. Uh, this is up at North, Omaha Northwest High School. So this is right on the campus near the greenhouse. Uh, this is a rain garden and outdoor classroom. I used to do a lot of service learning projects where we would combine the UNO students with uh, K through uh, 12 students from uh, Ralston I worked with as well as OPS. And one of the high school students uh, in, in one of the groups came up with this innovative idea of a butterfly as a rain garden and literally bringing uh, water off the greenhouse roof here uh, and through what would might look like antenna for the, for the butterfly. So this started an evolution of a lot of different ideas. Um, this was, uh, was a design that then I get helped the students evolve and we needed obviously something that a contractor could, could estimate and build for us. So the, the, the butterfly itself actually ends up being the rain garden cells with the water coming off the downspouts here. And then the body of the butterfly plus this paving is permeable. We'll talk about that in just a second. So it's a great extra example of green infrastructure. And then we had a bunch of native plants around the edges here, typical prairie plants. So it really kind of turned into more of an outdoor garden with a small rain garden uh, in the middle of it. So uh, to this day, the uh, environmental studies, AP, uh, there were horticulture students using this, uh, so it was very effective, even to the point of, of using cold of dwarf cultivar plants in the rain gardens, because typically you want nice short plants in these smaller areas, and would, for instance, a foot-tall cultivated goldenrod be as valuable 
for habitat as these, these native four, four foot tall goldenrod out here on the edge. And so it allowed the students to go out and actually look at, at pollinators and see what the difference is. The hope be, obviously being that this, the shorter ones that people appreciate more or at least accept more in natural settings uh, still had every bit as much value as the, as the native ones. And here, here's a couple of pictures of that garden. Uh, this was early on with the asters blooming up here on top. Um, you can kind of see the outline of the, uh, where the water actually settles. Again, water all gone within a day or so. This was fairly early on when we still had a lot of, a lot of mulch out there. And then this was two falls ago. Um, again, you can see how high some of these sunflowers and some of these other native plants have gotten. And even here within the wings of the butterfly, some of the dwarf cultivars have decided as they reseed, they wanna be a little bit taller uh, than what we have pushed them down to as cultivars. So uh, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's disconcerting to think that we would pull up perfectly healthy plants in some of these gardens because they decided they wanna grow as tall as their parents. Um, so typically that doesn't happen, but you can see that at some point the scale is kind of out of whack with a garden like this. So, but I think part of the sustainability process, again, is letting nature kind of do its thing and deciding where things actually need to be managed a little bit, if, uh, if, if at all. Uh, there's usually a sign with each one of these gardens. It's really important for people to understand how they work, what plants are out there, the fact that it is a functioning garden for habitat value and biodiversity, uh, as well as a nice place to go out and walk through and sit. And certainly the educational value is, uh, is very high. And I, I just want to mention this because I, 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 it, it was great. We actually were recognized on the National Geographic website for this garden for an outdoor, outdoor classroom. So uh, again, highly valued, uh, a lot of mileage, and uh, um, uh, again, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of value personally to know that this input uh, has been used by OPS. Uh, and it's great to see that the, uh, the high school kids out there uh, with smiles on their faces as they're, as they're counting butterflies. Uh, this is a little bit closer to home. This is the UNO Community Engagement Center rain garden. So again, as part of trying to bring habitat and, and plants for curriculum, et cetera, on, onto campus, um, this, this is uh, CPACs right here. This is the UNO Community Engagement Center uh, back here. So here, this is CPACs. Uh, this is where the bell tower actually is on campus. So the garden is right here. This is where the hyper building is and the soccer field is off there to the, uh, to the right. Uh, so we're, we're really talking about the area between the two buildings. Uh, as you'll see in a second, this area had nothing in it. This was just a mulched area down here at the bottom. And um, I would walk between the buildings during rainstorms and see all this water going down the sidewalk, washing the mulch out here on the side. Ultimately this going into the storm sewer but this river of water, it seemed like, well, couldn't we do something with it before it got into the storm sewer, taking all the mulch with it? So that was kind of the initial thought behind maybe doing something right here down at the bottom where we could pull water off that, that sidewalk. Um, this is what the initial site looked like. These, this is Miscanthus, which, which is, in my mind, an invasive ornamental plant. People love how this looks, but it's not natural or native here. Uh, it's native to China, and so the habitat value is low if, if non-existent. These are bald cypress trees, which love wet soil. They're actually native to Louisiana, uh, but adapted to Omaha here. So perfect trees as part of thinking that maybe we could actually put a, a rain garden cell right here in the, in the middle of this mulch area. And certainly enhance the, the beauty of this part of campus, and again, have another place to go look at plants for the, uh, for the plants classes. Um, the inspiration for this garden, I, some of you may have heard of these two sites. Lurie Garden is, is part of Millennium Park in Chicago. And then the High Line is a world-renowned garden at this point. I'm not sure how many miles long it is. It's, a, it's an old railroad trestle that was used to get into these warehouses that's been converted in essence to this linear trail quarter in, in uh, Manhattan in New York City. Uh, and one of the designers of these gardens, P Pete Udolph, believes in using plants for mulch. And I wanted to introduce that concept tonight. Uh, I mentioned mulch earlier. We use a lot of mulch. Um, oftentimes, I think we actually use too much. Uh, I see a lot of gardens renovated with three inches of mulch every single spring. Um, if you put enough mulch in a rain garden, sometimes you lose capacity in it. Uh, it looks neat and clean and tidy, and, and I can see why people like it. Um, 
but it will wash away in rain. Uh, it, 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 it's great for the soil, but it does have to be uh, renewed often. So the thought on these gardens is to literally let the plants form a dense enough layer on the ground plane uh, that they, in essence, minimize the weed pressure. Uh, and you really have multiple layers of plants then where the plants themselves are the mulch for these gardens. So based on that uh, inspiration, this was the design that we came up with. Um, and this was in conjunction with Kinghorn Gardens here in town. I've worked with Brian Kinghorn for a long time. And so the thought was to actually try to create these layers of, of mulch plants like sedges underneath the other plants that would come up through them. Uh, Wells Fargo donated time uh, as well as money for the sign out there, their, their green team. So that was great. Uh, this was uh, one of the springs where we had the uh, Kinghorn and uh, Wells Fargo working together. This was the first summer. So again, it's, it's interesting how quickly these perennials can grow. These are some of the sedges where the water, this is the four bay to keep sediment out. Uh, these are the sedges uh, that hold the soil as the water goes through. The actual rain garden is right about here. And then the overflow is right here. So the, in essence, the water would end up in the storm drain if all else fails. But there's also, as, as you see, some major uh, raised areas in the garden here and here where we have little blue stem and butterfly milkweed uh, and prairie plants that, that like it nice and dry and hot. So I guess another thing to mention in these gardens is the rain garden, the bathtub, so to speak, where the water sits is typically a, a much smaller part of these gardens. Uh, and it's the context for the garden as a whole that allows you to do a lot more with diversity and uh, uh, the habitat value for sure, because you have that much more variety of plants that you can put in. Uh, here's another uh, picture. So the butterfly milkweed, some liatris out there, gay feather, cone flowers. Uh, there's some swamp, swamp milkweed down here in the bottom where it's wet. And then the butterfly milkweed is up here on top uh, where it's dry. The milkweed obviously important nowadays for the, for the monarch butterfly habitat. This is little blue stem, um, which again will fill in and kind of form that dense mat. And then you can see how the taller plants kind of grow up through the, uh, the prairie drop seed, the little blue stem, and the, and the sedges, which are going to ultimately create that, that mulch layer, so to speak, versus having a lot of, of bark chips out here in this garden over time. Uh, and then again, for sustainable design, I think it's really critical to try to hopefully design for what looks good throughout the year. So this is probably November uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the little blue stem still has some of its red color. The bald cypress is a deciduous conifer, so it turns a nice rust color uh, and then loses its, its uh, needle foliage and then it grows back in the spring. Uh, the, the yarrow, uh, I think there's moonbeam or moonshine yarrow is still going crazy out there with, with some color to the foliage. So again, the idea of being able to, to have, still have habitat value, certainly there's a lot of seed out there that'll be used through the winter time, but to have something really nice to look at uh, I think in a lot of cases, the only downtime for these kind of gardens is when the, when the perennial foliage gets cut off uh, fairly early in the spring before it greens up. Uh, and it, but if you plant it properly, again, it doesn't take long before the, some of the plants that like to bloom in the spring and get, get going early, the cool season plants uh, start to fill in pretty quick. And then this is a, a backlit picture, just trying to emphasize, this is the butterfly milkweed that's gone to seed. Uh, so again, the habitat value for the butterflies is great. Uh, we've collected some of the seed to replant. This is little blue stem, which is a native prairie plant. It grows by the zillions along I-80. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to appreciate at 80 miles an hour on the interstate, but all of this collectively, again, on, a, on what tends to be kind of those days in November where you're thinking, well, it's, we're de it's dead again outside till, till next spring. There's, there's a lot going on here in terms of beauty as well as habitat. So. It's an, I think it's another important consideration for uh, sustainability for sure. So moving on to just a couple of other uh, BMPs or best management practices. I wanted to mention green rose permeable pavement because uh, they're also really critical pieces. And we have some of these available in, uh, in Omaha, uh, not as much as we might have on the coasts and in, in uh, Chicago, et cetera. But that just, uh, again, permeable pavement uh, the generic detail shows how the water can actually go down through this pavement. It might be pavers, it might be concrete. I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, and oftentimes you actually have an area to store water underneath this paving. Uh, first question I always get is, is what happens when it freezes? Don't we have damage? And the thought of this is the water goes through it and never gets a chance to freeze underneath 
and do all that popping that we typically have with potholes and, and broken concrete. So if it's designed right, the water literally goes through it. There, there is no damage in the wintertime. And in fact, I've seen pictures of permeable pavement in the wintertime where the ambient soil temperature is actually melting all of the snow off the permeable pavement adjacent to regular concrete or asphalt where the snow is still there. So in some ways, I, I, you might say it actually reduces maybe some of the icing potential on, uh, on pavement as well. Um, you can, this, this is just reinforced turf, turf parking up, at, up in Canada. Um, the, you can see these little circular plastic cells here, helps reinforce in terms of structural integrity. If you're gonna park cars and trucks on a gravel lot, which can be porous. Um, these are pavers over at the city of Omaha sewer maintenance facility. Uh, these are fairly large, as you can see. Um, this again was a demonstration project that I worked on with the city uh, to, to again, try different concepts. This is the bioretention garden down here at the bottom. And then this was the parking. So this picture shows, this is a, I don't remember how many gallons per minute this was, but I mean, literally picture a concrete truck shoving water out or maybe water out of a fire hose. And you can see how quickly that water goes down into this, this permeable pavement. So uh, there's a note here about uh, 2,170 gallons uh, design capacity. And that would be the storage underneath the, uh, the pavers. But I've seen upwards of what, 100 inches, uh, 100 inches an hour potentially of, of what water can get down through this. So even if it clogs, the main thing of, of this on maintenance is that you actually are supposed to vacuum it and power wash it. Because if these, if these cracks get clogged with sediment uh, and, and off, of, off of soil or, or other or paving, then it doesn't work as, uh, as designed. Um, it's more expensive, obviously, than regular pavement, but where you have a site where you don't have enough room for, for green landscape, this is another way to be able to, to, to manage runoff. Um, this is called pervious concrete. So this is concrete where the same aggregate size is used and it makes for little pores within the concrete. So the water can go right down through it, similar to what we saw with the pavers. Uh, this is a, a alleyway over in Council Bluffs that has pavers where the water from the asphalt goes into the pavers and then down into the uh, storm sewer. Uh, and it doesn't look very biological when you look at this pavement, but uh, research has shown that there are microbes that actually live underneath, for instance, this pervious concrete in the, in the rock and gravel. Um, and they've done studies where you literally pour oil or, or, or grease or gas down through this. And there's enough uh, biotic uh, habitat for microbes and living things that it actually gets broken down underneath this pavement. So as much as it doesn't look like the green landscape we've talked about, it has a lot of, of green uh, capability in terms of helping to to manage some of the pollutants that are typically virtually always part of our uh, urban stormwater runoff. Uh, green rows, wanted to mention those. Um, we've got the Gallup uh, green roof here. Uh, and then this is at Midtown Crossing, the one at the bottom. This is a sedum garden. Um, this is, would be considered more extensive because the, the media that these plants are growing in it typically is only six inches or less. Um, this gallop, I would say, is more of an intensive garden, given the, the depth of some of these planters. A lot heavier, you definitely have to uh, design a building to support that. But even to have these, these sedum beds out here uh, is beautiful. And there's a lot of benefits other than the aesthetics. This, this garden at Midtown Crossing is just outside the party room up on top on the, on the West Building. But if you consider that a typical gravel roof might be, let's just say, 150 degrees on a hot day, given the heat, um, and a, a sedum bed like this might only be, let's say, 80 degrees. Uh, you can imagine how much better that is for the air conditioning units here to be pulling in air that's what's 50, 60 degrees cooler to be able to cool this building. So there's, there's huge savings potential in terms of energy costs. The, the plants themselves help to insulate the roof. There can be noise, uh, uh, noise abatement. I, I, uh, there's been studies done near airports where that helps with... Uh, with reducing noise inside the building. Um, because the waterproof membrane in the roof is covered with the plants, uh, the waterproofing itself can last a lot longer versus the waterproof membrane that oftentimes is broken down by ultraviolet light and gravel and, and just in the wind action on, on top of the, the roof. So 
again, more expensive typically than a regular roof, uh, time and a half, maybe twice as much. But if you look at the life uh, the costs over time and how they build up, uh, oftentimes I think the, the point at which the investment is, is, is a sound one uh, is not all that far into the future, depending again on what the circumstances are for the particular roof. Uh, and I wanted to mention this one. Uh, this is actually native plants down in uh, Lincoln at Pioneers Park. Uh, one of my retired colleagues at UNL pushed hard to use native plants on rows versus the sedums that we saw earlier. Um, and you can imagine the additional habitat value on a roof like this with the little blue stem and some of the drop seed. And, and again, what's, what's amazing is that these plants are typically used to rooting down, what, five, 10 feet at least in a, in a, in a prairie uh, prairie location where they're where they're happy. They're, they've only got three or four inches uh, plus or minus to root down in on a roof like this. Again, for the weight distribution, etc. So um, uh, it's amazing how they are adaptable to be able to, to, to live in a in a place, in an ecosystem like this. And again, the habitat value is definitely there over the the uh, introduced cultivars and plants that typically wouldn't be native. So. I see more and more of these native plant roofs versus the traditional sedum. Um, we still don't have a lot of green roofs here in uh, in, in the Omaha area. There's a few, um, but again, it's it's more expensive, and it just over time, I, I think we'll, we'll see more of them. Any of the newer technologies like green roofs, uh, permeable pavement, uh, you need enough contractors comfortable with the process to be able to do it. So it, it costs tend to stay pretty high initially. Uh, until people really feel comfortable uh, and you have people willing to invest to, to do that. So um, sometimes people ask how, how often do you have to replant these or, or maintain them? Uh, these plants should be up there as, as long as they're happy. So it's not the kind of thing that you'd have to replant every year for sure. Um, and again, if, if, if something were to create a hole in the roof, uh, then you might have to pull plants out and replant them. But once they're there, they really should be there for the life of that waterproof membrane, which again is, has been shown to be sometimes three or four times longer than what a traditional membrane uh, would be. So, so it, uh, to wrap up here, I want to make sure I got done in plenty of time for, to, to look at questions. So uh, I wanted to mention a couple of resources here. Um, there's a, a website called omahaplants.org that, that I have worked on with the city uh, planning department and city uh, public works. Uh, it's still in process, so it's, we have a ways to go. But the, the context of this would be to actually have a searchable plant database to be able to say what, what, what is needed or wanted in a plant height, uh, growing conditions, wet or dry, uh, and then be able to plug that in and get some, 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 some feedback on what plants are, are really adapted and, and should do well here in Omaha. So uh, it should be a fairly valuable resource, I think, over time. And then this lower uh, website, omahastormwater.org, uh, has an amazing wealth of resources. If you're interested in green infrastructure specifically, um, there are a lot of handouts on some of the projects here in town. Uh, there's some, some educational resources for K through 12. Um, wide variety of information, again, as, as educational outreach to help the public understand what, what stormwater is, why it's a problem, the CSO, uh, why we've had to spend the money uh, in the city as we have. Uh, so it's another really good place to go. And then these, these publications on that previous Omaha Stormwater website, uh, this publication, the Sustainable Landscapes uh, and this, this uh, Bioretention Gardens are available as PDFs on that website. I, I can't remember now, this is an older version of the Plants Guide uh, that was sold through University Extension. Uh, I, the plant guide in the back of these two publications, which again are available as PDFs, should be the same one that this standalone uh, plant guide is. So, and a lot of this plant guide information has been folded into that plant database on the, on the web. So hopefully that evolution will uh, help us be up to date. Uh, it doesn't take long to get outdated when it comes to new plant cultivars and, and um, as we understand again better what plants do well in these sustainable landscapes, uh, it's important to try to keep those lists updated. So, oops, uh, one last thing I just wanted to mention. Uh, this is a, a link at UNL uh, uh, water.unl uh, website uh, and it's specific to landscapes and rain gardens. 
So there's a there's a rain garden guide if you want to build your own. Uh, it's a it's a PDF, an interactive PDF that actually takes you through the rain garden design process. Uh, there's a video on here. There's a, a animation that we built with a, a garden scale railroad model, and we can literally pour water on it. So so graphically with video we we show what happens to the water and, and all the kind of the rules of thumb that relate to uh, being able to plan and, and design, build and maintain a, a rain garden at a scale that would, people would be comfortable with, say that off the uh, downspout on the, on the front of your house. So again, another really important, uh, valuable um, place to go for information. So uh, with that, uh, be happy to entertain some questions here. It looks like we've got about 15 minutes, so we'll see how we do. Um, I'll go ahead and read a couple of them for you, Steve. Okay, um, so one of the first ones was back at one of the first UNO case examples that you showed in reference to one of the first rain gardens. And there's two that I'll kind of lump in with this. So the first question is, do you have to actively water this kind of garden or does it collect enough water to be more self-sustainable? And then what yeah. is general maintenance for a rain garden? Do you have to mow or cut everything back and when? Uh, I would say typical rain garden maintenance should, should be about the same as a regular landscape bed. Um, so typically if, if you're planting perennials, you'd be cutting back once a year, unless you have some shrubs included, which, which you wouldn't have to cut back. Um, so I, I think in a lot of ways, if, if people just think of this as an extension of what they might normally be doing in a more naturalistic landscape bed, I think that's that's pretty key. You might have to remulch if you're using mulch, um, but it should be kind of that once a year cutback like you would do on, on most perennials. Um, for the irrigation, anytime you plant new plants, even if they're native, they need to be irrigated. So I would say for the first, and, and a lot of times you're putting in plugs of plants. So the sedges are amazing rain garden plants. They, they tend to come in small sizes. You can put more in and, and plant them denser to, again, to, to minimize some of the weed pressure. Um, but they certainly, as a smaller plant, need more irrigation help to get started, especially if you're putting them in the spring to, to get into the heat of the summer. Um, so I think it, it's always really important to, to have irrigation capability, even through the first year of a garden like this, uh, because we do and can go weeks at a time in the summertime without any rain at all. So I would say it all depends on the year. Uh, in the last 15 years, if I remember the data right, uh, our average in Omaha is supposed to be 30 inches a year for precipitation. In the last 15, we've gone down to something like, what was it, uh, 12? And we've been upwards of 40 some. So the, our average, the, the, dif the, dis the difference between our low and high is almost as much as our yearly average. So, uh, so I hesitate to say a rain garden will take care of itself because again, we're gonna hit those years where there's hardly anything to take care of. So, uh, but for the most part, well uh, established native plants that are healthy, that have deep roots, that are planted in places that, that you know, full sun plant, full sun conditions are, are, are gonna do as well as any other plants to kind of get past those, those really critical times when uh, th things are really stressed out, especially with lack of water. Awesome. Um, so the next one was storage of water under those pavers of so the permeable pavement. Where does that water ultimately go? Is it collected and utilized by anybody in particular? Of, oftentimes it, it is routed back into the storm sewer system. Uh, so it's, it's anytime we can take the, the, the big rush of rain off when it initially starts, that's the important value because that rush is what we have to size all the stormwater pipes to. So if we can hold off the water getting down into the system, either with big tree canopies uh, or, 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 or any other way we can do it, that means that the system itself can be a little bit, uh, little bit smaller. So I would say that's kind of the, the critical piece for that. Um, is there a program in Omaha or anywhere locally in Nebraska that incentivizes building owners or even homeowners to install green roofs that you know of at least? Uh, I would, there may be that kind of a program in, in, in cities like Washington, DC, Chicago, uh, Seattle, Portland. Um, it, 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 uh, green roofs are probably as, as tricky as anything in, ter in terms of getting a good match with structural integrity of a building. If you design a new building, you're, you're good. Old buildings oftentimes, 
may need help to hold a green roof up. And it's not to say that they're that heavy. Um, you want nice light media to get the water out. So it's not necessarily a really heavy roof if you're only talking about a, one of the extensive uh, designs with, with several inches of, uh, of media. Um, but I, incentives I think are really critical in, in a lot of cases. Uh, people want to see extra reasons to, to do this work. And as much as uh, green roofs, I think, have been shown to pay back over time, it's still a pretty big stretch. Uh, there's a green roof here in, in Omaha on a residence that it's not, not all that big, but the people redoing this house wanted to really have everything they could do to, to be environmentally friendly. So, um, so it can be put in a fairly small area as well. But it, it, I would say there's, right now there's, there's about 2,000, I think there's over 2,000 BMPs in Omaha that have been the response to that managing the first half inch of runoff for the city. Uh, and a majority of those are buyer retention gardens, as we've looked at. There are some green roofs on that list, but a, a much smaller number, I think, just given the complexities of having to fit that on top of a, of a roof. And as you said, I'm sure we'll start to see as environmentally friendly cities continue to grow, specifically Omaha, I'm sure we'll see more and more of that to pop out. But um, another really good one that a couple of people have asked where and when can people in Omaha and Lincoln area obtain native plants this year for planting? Um, favorites. One of the best, one of the best resources is the Nebraska Statewood Arboretum down in Lincoln. Um, and I think, I think they have pickup. What they've done with COVID, I think, is, is you put an order in and then you go down and pick up and they, they load the plants for you. Uh, Spring Affair is the classic place to go get native plants uh, and adapted plants uh, in Lincoln. Uh, I'm not sure what the status of that is. Um, in fact, that may be part of the, the pickup with the, the automobiles. But I think Statewide Arboretum is as good a resource as any for plant information, I think, as well as kind of keeping up with what plants are available. Um, they try to keep people that want plants well stocked. They handle kinds of plants that sometimes are a little bit harder to come by at the larger nurseries. Um, and then another place that I've worked a lot with is Great Plains Nursery out of Western Nebraska um, as, a, as a source of root bag grown trees. Uh, they tend to have a lot of more native trees. Uh, they're not as big a trees, but they're well rooted. Um, uh, there's a lot of good nursery stock here in Omaha. There's some great contractors to work with. Um, but I, I would say, I guess th those are the two. And, and, and the number one would be the statewide arboretum through, through East Campus in terms of the native plant, uh, plant resources. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna do our quick polling for Conservation Nebraska. You'll, everybody will just see it pop up on their screen, but I'll keep asking a couple more questions while we have five minutes or so left. Um, what do you recommend as an alternative to turf grass for a homeowner? Um, I guess it all depends. Um, if I think, I think bluegrass, bluegrass to me is the ultimate in terms of, of resource intensiveness. So I think even, even to use turf type fescue, and again, a lot of this is my experience. So, uh, I've worked a lot, so I'm not trying to make any, any absolute recommendations, but the turf type fescue tends to be deeper rooted. Uh, it was more adaptable in the places that I've used it. Um, so it, it's a little bit less resource intensive. It'll, it'll stay greener longer than bluegrass typically will, but bluegrass, if it's rooted well and healthy, will go dormant in the summer and come back in the fall, and turf type fescue won't tend to do that. If, if it runs out of water, you're, it's cooked. So uh, it, you really kind of have to dive a little bit deeper, I think, in terms of, of what you want. Buffalo grass is the ultimate thing to replace turf grass with. It's a native prairie plant. It gets several inches tall, um, but it has an off green, a kind of a green gray color, and it's fuzzy. And a lot of, I've known people who have literally put an acre of it in, and after a year had to take it out because their neighbors kept asking them what was wrong with their yard, and it just wasn't, it wasn't the right look. So um, part of it depends, again, on just what people are comfortable with. And we love neat and tidy. Uh, we're taking care of our, our property when we're neat and tidy. And native plants and fuzziness and a plant leaning a little bit oftentimes is a real quandary for people in terms of trying to figure out how that 
look is accepted, especially if the rest of the neighborhood is, is all neat and tidy. So um, uh, turf is a great plant. We can walk on it. it it's, uh, you know, we can play on it. Um, I, so I think one of the major things is to try to put plant turf where we can use it and then use other plants uh, where it's more aesthetic, where we can do biodiversity. So turf in itself should not be bashed and we get rid of turf because it certainly has a lot of uses in the landscape. All right, we'll do one last one. Um, should we have a professional help to build our own rain garden or wetlands? Or is it something that we can do on our own? Obviously, I guess you posted all the awesome resources too. I, I think if it's a relatively small size, I think there's plenty of resources for that. Where I, where I think I would look for the professional help is uh, if, if, um, if, it's, if it's water running into your backyard from three or four of your neighbors, for example or um, um, there's, a, there's a site out in Springfield that somebody's asked me to look at where it, it appears that the rain garden that they wanna plant uh, is dammed up by their driveway that comes into the house. And so if there was an overflow there, maybe it washes out their front driveway. So I think a lot of it is a, is a scale. I think what I would probably do is look at the resources that, that I was mentioning and see if it fits the scale of what you want to do. And if it's, if it's outside that, then I, I think it's probably really important to, to at least get an opinion about whether or not there are issues beyond what you're seeing that either could you could do more harm than good, I suppose, in terms of trying to corral water and then have it not go where you want it to go. Makes sense. Wouldn't want it to be on the side of your house without realizing. <laughs> and, and no, and, and every, every one of these should have an overflow. Um, you need to know where the water's going to go because you design them for about nine out of 10 rain events. And when we get that four inch rain, you need to know where the water is going to go when it overflows. And so it doesn't decide where it wants to go because oftentimes it's towards the house. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This was incredible. Everybody seems to have enjoyed it very well as well. And then if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out on the Conservation Nebraska Facebook page and I will definitely relay to Steve as best as we can and get some more of them answered. I, I would be happy to do that. Ashley, there's a bunch of chat questions on here. Yeah. So I don't, um, I'm supposed to be retired, but, oh. but this is too much fun. So <laughs> um, I, I would do my best to try to get specific information back. And people on the chat are also throwing out some really good names of other resources absolutely uh, for uh, midwest natives and etc so so um i wouldn't take anything i said tonight as as the the only way to do things for sure there's a lot of a lot of resources out there i think we're lucky in nebraska to have them definitely yeah we've got lots of more events coming up too in the next month or so of native pollinators and things to do within your own backyard which will also help answer some of these other questions too so it's all a work in progress so like I say, Ashley, I, I'll see what I can do. Oh, stock, somebody mentioned stock seed farms. Again, excellent yes. as a resource for, uh, for seed, yeah. I think that Fontenelle Forest too, if you reach out, will sometimes have native seed that you can purchase. And they also have information for plugs as you specifically mentioned, I know, because I've reached out for my own personal garden as well and they've been very helpful, so. Right, right. The, the more we ask for this stuff, the more it, would, it, will, it will be available. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and a lot of this stuff, again, is not typically your, the, the stuff that is bright colored all summer or it, it's stuff that tends to be a little bit in the background. Uh, and oftentimes the major nurseries just haven't stocked it because nobody's ever asked for it. So the yeah. more, more we're asking, the more we'll have it available. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Anything else from you that you would like to note? No, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I wish I had more time. Uh, and uh, but it's eight o'clock. I'm not sure. I, I don't remember the last time I was actually done on time that I didn't go over what you <laughs> to say. So I'll I'll take that. <laughs> well, we can always plan for another too, because I'm sure that this will be continue to be a learning process as well. So yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Steve. I will talk to you shortly as well. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you, everybody, for joining.